Joining us, we are live in downtown Charlottesville in our studio on Market Street. It's an absolute pleasure to connect with you guys through this network on a Halloween Tuesday. Happy Halloween to everyone watching this fine and fair talk show. If you could take a look at the screen for the headlines that we will discuss today, we ask you, the viewer and listener, to be a part of the program. Join us with your comments ask questions, shape the discussion. We will adapt to what you have on your mind. I'll give you a rundown of what we're going to discuss today. Sonia Smith is a political kingmaker within the Democratic Party. Sonia Smith is having an election on a school board race in Almoro County. An influence like I've never seen at the local level. Sonia Smith and her husband, Michael Bills, are undoubtedly kingmakers in the Commonwealth. Kingmakers to a larger influence or extent than even Dominion Electric. We'll explain how Sonia Smith is stuffing the ballot box with her campaign contributions. Also on today's program... I want to talk about the future of 1417 Emmett Street. We broke the news yesterday for you. Tim Carson's listing on Emmett Street, a commercial property with 28,000 vehicles driving by every single day with five locally owned businesses currently housed within it, has a bright upside. Is that upside an Asian market, an international grocery store, a multilingual church, a Mexican restaurant, gift shop, and bakery, a barber shop, and a lounge. That topic on today's show. Also on the program, I want to talk Tony Elliott. This football team may only have two victories on its resume this year, but I'm going to put in perspective for you how close the head football coach at the University of Virginia was to potentially being the ACC Coach of the Year and it's crazy to say this, he may still even have a shot at that award. We'll explain how and why on the Tuesday edition of the I Love Seville show. I like real estate. Many of you know that we invest in real estate, we trade real estate, and we chatter real estate on this program. Along with the 1417 Emmett Street transaction, I want to highlight a commercial property um, on Garrett Street. It's 200 Garrett Street to be exact, it's 7,440 square feet. You have a link of the listing. If you can grab those photos so we can show them on screen. It's got an asking price of $2,150,000, and I think it's got a fair amount of upside. I'm going to explain why. All those stories and more on the I Love Seville show today. I encourage you guys to support Reed's Market on Preston Avenue, and I encourage you to support Reed's Market on Preston Avenue by purchasing gift cards. Leave the limited groceries on the shelves to the community and citizens around Reeds, many who walk to the grocery store or take public transportation to the grocery store. If you want to support this business, do it with the purchase of gift cards. Also on today's program, I'm going to highlight the upside of Reeds, the family that owns the real estate, along with the business on the real estate. Is the future a grocery store? Or is the future the value of the dirt that has so much potential? The lead of today's program is Sonia Smith. It is no secret that Sonia Smith, her husband, Michael Bills, are kingmakers. Um, Smith and Bills are contributing more to local elections than... Dominion Electric of late? I, I really want to put that in perspective. You have a company that has a pretty much a monopoly, dominant market share on powering homes, providing electricity, a company who has every reason, every motive to get their hand-picked candidates into office so their hand-picked candidates 
can create policy legislation and laws that benefit Dominion Electric. They have every reason to try to influence, manipulate, use their vast pockets to influence the outcome of Commonwealth-wide elections. And still, Sonia Smith and Michael Bills, their combined influence supersedes Trump's dominions. That really puts things in perspective. I want to localize Sonia Smith. Um, she is undoubtedly democratic in her leaning. She favors, history suggests, women with her campaign dollars. Sonia Smith, the top contributor to Nakia Walker's campaign for city council in 20, gosh, when was that? 2018? Nakia Walker? Sonia Smith, a significant funder of Sally Hudson. Sally Hudson lost to Cree Deeds in a Democratic primary for state Senate. Sally Hudson has had over $200,000 contributed to her campaign by Sonia Smith. Sonia Smith funds Democrats. She funds females. And she's not afraid of where those Democrats and those females rest or lie or fall on the democratic spectrum. Some are socialists. Some are activists. Some are centered Democrats. Some run for state senate. Some run for delegate. And some even run for the Albemarle County School Board. We've had recent campaign finance reports released on VPAP. I love the website, Virginia Public Access Project, vpap.org. And I'm going to highlight the school board race that has got the country talking. And if you do not think the country is following the Allison Spillman, Dr. Meg Bryce race, you are not reading the tea leaves cor correctly. It's not just Central Virginia. It's not just Albemarle County. It's not just Richmond, the entire state. It is the country following this race. And why the country is following this race is because we are a year before a presidential election. And we've learned from friend of the program, David Toscano, that what happens in Virginia is an indication, an indicator of what will happen potentially at the national level. National level. It's called being a, a, a bellwether, an indicator of what's to come. So... We are watching, not just in central Virginia, not just in the Commonwealth, but across the nation, what's going to, be hap what's going to happen between two polar opposites. You have Dr. Bryce, and you have Allison Spillman, and you have a combined 315,863 dollars in total funds raised. I will give you that number again. $315,863 have been raised up until this point, and more money will come. This race, if you break it down per student, I went to the Albemarle County Public School website, and in the calendar year of 2022 to 2023, this past calendar year, there were 13,970 students enrolled within Albemarle County Public Schools. That breaks down to $22.61 per student. You take the total dollars raised of over 315,000 amongst the two candidates, and you got 13,970 students, and that chops up to 22 bucks in change per kid. <coughs> That's astronomical to me. Think about how many school bus drivers could be hired for $315,863. How much do the bus drivers make? 20, 25, $30,000 a year, maybe? Let's just say the school bus driver makes $25,000. It's a part-time job. 
I'm going to take $315,863 and I'm going to divide it by $25,000. You got an extra 12 school bus drivers, almost 13 school bus drivers that you can hire for this amount of money. That would solve a transportation crisis. What's the average ACPS teacher make? Let's just use the number 50 grand for easy math. $315,863 divided by 50K. You got an extra six teachers and a half a teacher you can hire. Six and a half teachers with these campaign dollars. That's politics in 2023, people. Politics in 2023 is as much about mailers and social media and, and, and campaign events and shaking hands and kissing babies. But what it's really about is how much money a candidate can raise. Because the money drives the votes. And Sonia Smith is driving votes like no other person in this race. Sonia Smith is driving votes in this race at a clip that I would say is even potentially greater than Spillman and Bryce individually. Sonia Smith has injected $70,000 on paper to Allison Spillman. Furthermore, Sonia Smith has donated $15,000 to the Almoro Parents Promoting Learning PAC, a political action committee. The Almoral Parents Promoting Learning PAC Apple, the political action committee, is run by Chris Seaman. Chris Seaman, some say the former campaign manager of Allison Spillman, regardless in the cabinet of Spillman and one of the key contributors to the Spillman think tank. So, Sonia Smith gives Spillman 70 G's directly over four contributions. You had 20,000 on October 2nd, 20,000 on October 19th. You had 15K before the September 15th filing deadline and 15K before the October 15th filing deadline. Then she kicks another 15 G's to a PAC that's directly funding Spillman. You can make a legitimate argument that Sonia Smith has contributed 85,000 directly and indirectly to Allison Spillman's quest for the at-large seat on the school board. 85 G's. Now remember, Spillman in totality has raised 190 G's. That means Sonia Smith is responsible for 45% of Spillman's campaign contributions. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called influence. It's called clout. It's called power. It's called king making. Now, are Smith's donations toward the Spillman campaign more because Spillman is the candidate Smith wants to see in office? Or more because Bryce is the candidate Smith does not want to see in office? That's a question only Sonia Smith can answer. I'll ask it again. Sonia Smith's $85,000 direct and indirect, are they as much about Allison Spillman or are they as much about Bryce and Smith not wanting Bryce to be in office? Only Sonia can answer that question. $315,863 in campaign collective contributions is a disheartening number. And I applaud both women for fundraising expertise and talent. But in an era, in a time, in a period where kids cannot get to school on time on school buses and when administrators and janitors and coaches and, and teachers aides and teachers themselves are vastly underpaid, I ask you, the viewer and listener, is this $315,000 best spent on radio ads and television commercials 
and mudsling, mudslinging mailers in social media boosted post campaigns or is it best spent to get more teachers in the schools and more bus drivers on the roads? Let's weave Judah Wickower in on a two shot. Did the number take you aback? Did it shock you? Were you flabbergasted? Were you angry? Were you befuddled? What were the feelings you experienced when you read my commentary on ilovesevil.com? I mean, it is a little surprising that this much money is going to a, uh, a school board race. Um, but this is Charlottesville. I'm not sure what to say. Uh, they uh, do like their Democratic candidates. Democrat candidates, I should say. Can I put it in perspective even more for you? Sure. The combined funds amongst the two candidates represent roughly one and a quarter percent of a yearly school budget. Hmm. The combined funds of these two candidates represent the superintendent's entire salary for a year and a vice principal's entire salary for a year. Together? Together. I tried to break it down. Deep Throat offered this statistic this morning. Thank you, Deep Throat. $22.61 per student. The combined campaign contributions for both candidates versus 13,970 students within ACPS. Hmm. More to come. We're not even at election day. It's on Tuesday. It's an off, off year. And we're already hear, hearing early voting and mail-in voting is not progressing at the clip of previous races. Unbelievable. Follow the money. When you follow the money, you follow the power. When you find the power, you ask questions. And the questions I want to ask, what is the intent of Sonia Smith contributing to this race at this clip? Let's go to the next topic. Viewers and listeners, what are your questions? Sarah Hill Buchensky says this. While I think the funds could be better spent towards educating the children, you cannot win an election if you don't raise money. It's good that people are interested in showing it with their money in this school board race. She also asked the question, does Sonia Smith have children in ACPS, i.e. a vested interest? Sonia Smith does not have children within <coughs> ACPS. I'm also very curious of what her vested interest in is. And I would ask her directly, if I could, is this about Spillman winning or is this about Bryce not winning, in your opinion? I'd be very curious to hear Sonia's answer to that question. I would bet you Sonia's answer to that question is more about Bryce not winning than Spillman winning. John Blair on LinkedIn. When you were talking about the region's branding problem, this is exhibit A. If you wanted to say that your region is exclusive and only for the rich, the idea of spending 316000 for one school board election is about as good as you can get. Yeah. Bingo. John Blair on LinkedIn. Very well said. Grayson on Facebook in North Downtown. Thank you for bringing attention to this, Jerry. You seem to be the only one covering her influence, Miss Smith's, on this race and other races. Are other media platforms nervous, scared, or terrified of the influence of Sonia Smith and her husband? Why do we not see this elsewhere besides the I Love Seville show? You got a take on that, Judah? Uh, 
I mean, who do we have for? We do have some good local uh, local journalists, but I don't know how much uh, how much the papers that they work for would be pushing this kind of information, right? I don't follow. Are the papers looking to uh, to investigate this? Which you're talking progress? Yeah. This is news, right? I mean, what's your take here? Why are the other media outlets not covering this? I mean, I would say it could be a combination of a lack of of a lot of you know we've lost a lot of the the reporters we've had in this area. And again, if uh, if none of the local news agencies want to cover this, then uh, it might be hard for someone like, say, um, uh, some of the some of the local heavies to uh, to really give it much attention. This is why it's not being covered by other media outlets, ladies and gentlemen. It's not being covered by other media outlets because you have fresh out of college reporters and journalists on the education beat. You don't have institutional memory. They're underpaid, they're overworked, and they're underappreciated. Digging into campaign finance reports takes time. It took me an hour and change today to bring you the data that's on ilovesevil.com. It takes time. You have to have nuance, sophistication, institutional memory, and you have to be willing to do the work. It's not a press release story. So much of what you see on the news is 15 to 30 seconds of press release regurgitation. This is not. I find it important to relay to you that one woman has $85,000 of influence or clout over a candidate on the school board. A candidate who clearly appears to be a front runner to win. I think that's important because when a candidate takes 85 grand direct or indirect from a kingmaker, it comes with strings attached. Always remember the money comes with strings attached. Chad Wood says, imagine spending that much money on a campaign that supports the current failing policies. Carly Wagner says, clearly social media robots, sorry, I mean freelance writers, is what this money is best spent on. She's talking about the folks that are commenting on Meg Bryce's Facebook campaign page. There's a couple, a what appears to be either boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife. The, the man is a musician who appears to be out of Richmond that frequently and routinely comments on Meg Bryce's campaign Facebook page to the point the comments are divisive and disruptive, but when you have a campaign page, you cannot delete what is on there. You cannot legally delete the comments on a campaign page. Carly Wagner said, I attended a meeting for Meg Bryce, and at the end of the meeting, someone asked, how can we donate or help? Her response was, honestly, I do not need any more donations. Frankly, we have had more donations than we ever expected or needed or thought possible. Please pray for the kids of the schools. Pray for my husband. Help fight the false narratives about me and what my platform is with data. Please don't engage in the mudslingers. Nice. It's an ugly, icky business. Politics. All right, next topic. You have some photos from the story we put together on 1417 Emmett Street. Mm -hmm. If you can rotate those photos and give me a thumbs up when they're on screen. This is the Asian market. Uh, not, the, not Garrett Street. Not Garrett? 1417 Emmett Street, J-Dubs. It's the one with the Asian market, the Mexican grocery. It's from ilovesevil.com. You put it together yesterday. If you could rotate those photos on screen, that would be great. Let us know, viewers and listeners, for the viewers and listeners when they are on screen. Uh, give me a while to get them ready. Went under contract for $3,350,000 in just 17 days. 
1417 Emmett Street is home to five locally owned businesses, an Asian market, an international grocery, a multilingual church, a Mexican restaurant, a barbershop, a lounge. 19,000 square feet, 28,000 vehicles whizzing by per day, currently zoned urban corridor, but it will be up zoned NX5, which will allow a five to six story building under the new up zoning regulations. I've had probably four dozen people ask me directly or indirectly, what is the future of this building? And Sarah Hill Buchansky and Carol Thorpe, I will get to your comments on our first subject here in a matter of moments, I promise. They've asked me, what is the future of Emmett, this building on Emmett Street 1417? Most of the comments have had this theme or thesis. The businesses in this building are an Asian market, a Mexican grocery, a Mexican restaurant, bakery, a multilingual church, and a Latino barber. They serve an important, they fill an important niche within Charlottesville, Albemarle, and Central Virginia. A niche focused in servicing our minority population. The theme of the comments and questions I've asked since breaking the story, that have been asked of me since breaking the story is, will these businesses survive? The question I have, the answer to those questions is, I just don't know. Judah's rotating the photos on screen. These photos courtesy of Tim Carson. I just don't know. I do know these businesses are under lease for much of 2024. So they have runway to potentially transition out. When an investor or a high net worth individual spends $3,350,000, that was the asking price, it went under contract within 17 days, it's got up zoning potential, I would bet you it traded at asking price or pretty damn close to it, we'll find it on the GIS once it closes, but I'm betting you it's asking price or pretty close to it. When someone pays this kind of jack, this kind of money for a building like this, return on investment and upside are undoubtedly considered. I don't think the future, and this is me talking, this is me talking, this is not the investor, this is not the broker, this is just me hypothesizing. I don't think the future of this building is a barbershop, a multilingual church, an Asian market, and a Mexican restaurant. I think the future of this building is to be determined, but when you're spending nearly three and a half million dollars, you're gonna need return on investment, and you're gonna be considering cap rate and price per square foot. And right now, the price per square foot, the rent per square foot that you're earning, probably isn't flirting with market. And that's just how the cookie crumbles. And it's unfortunate, it's capitalistic, it's Darwinistic, but that's how folks can afford to buy $3,350,000 buildings. Because they make decisions and they monetize those, those decisions and they do it again. Time will tell. My crystal ball has proven to be quite accurate on this talk show. I want to show you an additional building that I think has a lot of promise. Let's rotate 200 Garrett Street on screen. This is an office condo. It's 7,440 square feet. The asking price is $2,150,000. It's right next to ACAC. It's got views of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's right next to the downtown mall. It's got nine reserved parking spaces. Those nine reserved parking spaces have a market value 125 times nine have a market value, the parking spaces alone, of $1,200 a month. The parking spaces are inside a garage. They're not even street spaces. You can walk to the downtown mall. You can walk to ACAC. You can walk to Three Notched. It's got an open floor plan and mixed private offices. It's got massive windows, nine-foot ceilings, A-plus finishes, This is the question I have for you. Office space right now is vulnerable. It's got a bit of exposure. 
Banks have exposure with their lending to these office spaces. The refinancing environment has exposure. The folks that own the space have vacancies. The future is up in the air. Is this an opportunity for a strategic investor to go deep in office or commercial purchasing? The old Warren Buffett mindset. Be greedy when everyone's scared and scared when everyone's greedy. Everyone's scared of office space right now. Will a strategic and opportunistic investor utilize that fear to his or her advantage by scooping up deals at below market rates? And then two, three years from now, they buy distressed assets. And two, three years from now, those distressed assets appreciate 30, 40, 50, 60% in value. There's a building on the downtown mall right now. I've highlighted this on previous shows. The building was the previous home to Vita Nova and the previous home to the escape room. 310 and 312 East Main Street. It's been on the market with an asking price of $2,750,000. It's got 23,000 square feet literally on the downtown mall. It's next to the Seville Weekly, right next to the hardware store. No one's showing any interest in purchasing this. Is someone going to scoop these types of opportunities up at a 25 to 30 percent haircut? Sit on them for 12, 24 to 36 months, allow the market to recover, and then really be rolling in it? Time will tell. But it's that affinity for risk that creates wealth of the generational variety. Now, I want to weave Judah Wickhauer in on the Reed Super Save market topic. Let's get you on a two shot. Yesterday, and I heard this from say, five or six viewers and listeners. You were quite bearish when it came to the future of reeds and grocery stores in general. Is that fair? Yeah, I guess so, by the looks of things. I mean, uh, the information that I have, uh, reeds looks like it's in a very bad position. I mean, if, uh, if you have to ask people to not buy what, uh, what a business is selling because then they won't have anything to sell. I mean, that, uh, I don't think that, that's a good look. Um, You're talking the gift card push from Reeds. Yeah, I mean, any business that can't afford to buy more of what they're selling is, I would say, on the way out, right? I mean, I'm not, this isn't like a, this isn't like a, a wild uh, take on things, I don't think. If they're having, I mean, they were clearly having trouble buying, you know, stocking their shelves before all of this. So asking them, asking people to not buy things from them, I, I'm not really sure how that, you know, I, I understand that, uh, that buying gift cards could help them, uh, could help them put together enough to, I don't know, order another shipment of whatever. But how long before, uh, before they're in the, this position again? Um, and I would, I would love to see them, you know, find a way. I would love to see them pull themselves out of this. But, again, if they're already at the point where, uh, where things coming off the shelves is bad because they won't be able to put things back on the shelves, I don't see how, I don't see how uh, gift cards is going to fix that. Fair. All fair. The gift card approach is a runway approach to help Reed's potentially recover. I, and I appreciate it. I just <coughs> like I like I said, if uh, <clears throat> if they've already been at the point for weeks where uh, they can't afford to restock the shelves, um, who knows how much money they need and and how long mm -hmm. it'll be if they get the money before that is any use in the store. All fair. What if I told you Reeds, the Reeds family, owns the real estate? What if you told me that they own the real estate? What if I told you the Reeds family owns the real estate, viewers and listeners? Q2. 
Cameron Wells Marsh, welcome to the show. John Snow, welcome to the show. What if I told you the future and the upside of Reed's Market <coughs> was not a grocery store? The future and upside of Reed's Market was the dirt under the grocery store. Okay, but that's kind of meaningless considering the fact that we've been touting. Well, there's the fact that Reed's is, as we talked about, a, uh, a necessity for a lot of people in the area, uh, in a, uh, an area notably uh, lacking in, uh, in good choices for, uh, for grocery. <laughs> it's a grocery, grocery desert. Yeah. It's a grocery desert. It's a food desert. So, so okay, I, if you're saying that uh, what if the value of reeds is in the... Let's cut it, to the chase, okay? The what Let's cut mean? to the chase. The future of grocery shopping is not going inside a, sh a big building and putting groceries in a shopping cart and spending two and a half hours of your day driving to a box getting out of your car, walking amongst the aisles in a crowded store with patrons and strangers you don't know, potentially collecting as much sickness as you do grocery, then getting the items off a shelf, putting them in a cart, waiting in line next to strangers, checking out, taking those groceries back to your car, then unloading them from your car onto the cupboards of your house. That is not the future of grocery store shopping. Anyone who watches this program knows that. The future of grocery store shopping is having a list of 100 items on the internet, on Target Grocery, Walmart Grocery, Amazon Grocery, Whole Foods Grocery, Instacart, whatever the hell you'd like to do your shopping, saying every week on Monday at 10 a.m., I want to reorder this and having those groceries delivered to your house an hour to two hours later. We all know that's the future. We saw what Amazon did with shopping. Judah makes weird faces right now. Because Do you not think the future of grocery shopping is groceries delivered to people's houses, Judah? I hope not. Well, hope and reality are two different things. Well, then why are we asking people to buy gift cards? For because me? we're helping sustain a business for as long as possible because it fills a need for a community. Okay. I would make a legitimate argument. The folks that are buying groceries at Reed's, most of those groceries are purchasable online. Are they not? Well, of course they are. Juan Sarmiento leaves this comment on the feed. I went to Reed's the other day. He's the king of transportation. He says, I went to Reed's the other day. Unfortunately, I was only able to purchase two of the five items I went looking for. It's disappointing and it doesn't look good. Bill McChesney says the future is probably a tear down at that location. Everyone watching this program, I want Reeds to survive. That's why we're driving this gift card campaign strategy on the I Love Seville show. This program and this platform for the last two weeks has driven more positive awareness to support this local icon than any other platform or brand in Central Virginia. We're utilizing our reach and influence to get folks to purchase gift cards at this grocery store. But Judah Wickhauer, and you're on a two-shot, highlighted yesterday that buying gift cards in the short term to give a business a cash injection is not a sustainable long-term plan. Did you not make that up argument? I think I was making it today. Made it yesterday and made it today. And you're a thousand percent right. You're a thousand percent right. A two-unit grocery store is going to have a very difficult time competing against publicly traded companies or family-owned businesses like Wegmans that have hundreds of units, if not thousands, and have purchasing power, economies of scale, and vertically integrated advantages. The best thing that Reed's has going for itself right now is the fact that it has a captive customer base that may not have the transportation to get to and from the grocery store, and with a captive customer base, it has customers who need to walk to the grocery and walk home, or public transport to the grocery store and public transport back home. You can make a legitimate argument that the future of this business is not buying 
groceries from shelves or going to the best meat department out there, one of the best craft beer departments out there. Family owns the dirt and the real estate. Do we think the future of XR Park is XR Park like we see it today? No. No, we don't. Do we think the future of... What's another good example? The future of downtown Belmont is what it is today with those shopping stores? Or, heck, is the future of the downtown mall what it is today? Do we think the future of the downtown mall is boutiques selling expensive things to tourists, students, and locals alike? Or do we think the future of the downtown mall is experiential opportunities for students, tourists, and locals alike? Decades Arcade is a good example. The upside with Reeds is the real estate, and that's me speaking frankly. It's the dirt and the opportunity that comes with that location on Preston Avenue. And eventually, the decision will be made, do we capitalize and monetize the dirt with an exit strategy of listing the dirt and the building? Just like I highlighted a $3 million, $350,000 sale with an Asian market and a Mexican grocery store on Emmett Street. Do I think Reed's can get $3,350,000? Maybe. Possibly. Doesn't have the traffic that 1417 Emmett Street does. <coughs> Probably not as big as 1417 Emmett Street. But Preston Avenue is a pretty damn good location. And look at what Preston's becoming with Dairy Market, Dairy Central, and Brewery Row. And as Carly Wagner just highlighted, right across the street from Bodo's, Florence Worley Via said, I went to Reed's yesterday to get my meat for the week, and they have the best meats in the area. Their meat department is banging. Curtis Shaver said, I went to Reed's yesterday for steaks for dinner, and they were very appreciative of the support. Curtis Shaver's got a wedding on the horizon. Can't wait to go. John Snow says, you are speaking the truth, Jerry. Orders are remembered, and fridges are getting smarter as well. It's not if, it's when with the digital grocery purchasing. You get a list. You may like this, Judah. Now, your, your shopping is probably... How often do you go grocery shopping? Uh, I don't think there's any uh, set... <clears throat> do you have groceries in your fridge? You're a bachelor, living the bachelor life. Do you have groceries? If I went to your house right now, to your estate, your abode, and I opened your fridge, what would I see in there? Mm, there's various drinks there's some uh there's carrots and celery there's uh this is what is in judah's fridge various drinks carrots and celery i wasn't done but okay sure, go ahead what else is in the grocery what else is in your fridge i mean i've got salmon i've got i don't know i, I can't name everything i've got uh cream cheese for the everything bagels that aren't in the fridge do you cook every night no, not every night. Do you mainly eat out? It's roughly even, give or take. It's totally cool. You're a bachelor. You should be doing that. I'm not throwing shade. I'm not. I didn't think you were. I'm, yeah. I'm, like I said, it's fairly even. He's got carrots, celery, and drinks. Okay. No. <laughs> Don't get so sensitive. Just... I'm not, but you're like... Acting like I've got nothing in my fridge but carrots, celery, and drinks. Is the fridge crowd, is the fridge packed? It's not packed, but it's got stuff in it. On the level of stuff in the fridge, what percentage would you characterize it? What? I don't even know how to answer that. 40% full? If it was 100% full, everything would be going bad. I'm only one person. That's my point. It's exactly okay. the point I'm making here. Well, then make the point. I'm making the point. For someone like you, spending time to go to the grocery store could be better spent just clicking on your phone and having them delivered to your doorstep. It's if I knew exactly what I wanted. Well, 
My you point miss is, out on so much. My point is this. This is my point. Look at what we've seen in the last few months. We've seen reads in financial difficulty. We've seen the building that hosts the Asian market and a Mexican grocery store just go under contract on Emmett Street. We've seen Rebecca's Natural Food close after like 28 years of Mm -hmm. being in business. Rebecca's has closed. We saw the Aldi close on 29, a big brand close, right? How many locally owned groceries are left? We're over groceried in this region. We've got too many of them, right? Especially in the era of grocery online ordering. Okay. My point is a box with stuff on a shelf that takes two hours round trip is not the future. What is the future is that dirt and that location. And no one can argue with that. Comments are coming in faster than I can keep up. And I appreciate you viewers and listeners for leaving your comments. Janice Boyce Trevilian says, in Louisa County, no, no one delivers out here. We don't even get pizza delivery. So we still have to get groceries at the grocery store. And Vanessa Parkhill, thank you for the correction. Aldi is still open. It's Lytle that closed. Little, Lytle. Is it Lytle? I think it's Lidl. Little closed. She also said, I don't want to order all my groceries online. I like shopping in person for groceries and other goods. I do too. Vanessa Parkhill says, the funds pouring into the at-large school board seat are indicative of how important the education of our children are, is to the future of our country. If there's any question about this, we need to ask ourselves how we end up with so many elite college students and professors not speaking up for safety of the people in the Middle East, but wishing death to Jewish people, she says. These are clearly intelligent people, but I cannot imagine they have been taught enough about history or how else, or else how could they be calling for such hateful things? Yeah. She's referencing the University of Virginia professor who is backing Hamas. Yeah. That whole thing has turned into an absolute mess, a travesty. Yeah, no doubt. You got war crimes on every side being committed. You got a festival in Israel where 1,200 people lost their life going to a festival that was about peace and love, a music festival. Israel tells Palestine, get the hell out because we're going to destroy your country. Innocent civilians leave right now. Is innocent civilians by the tens of thousands, if not the hundreds of thousands, choose not to leave? Uh, well, I don't know. If they, some of them may have chosen not to leave. I think some of them were stopped. By Hamas? No, some of them were stopped at borders by people like, by places like Egypt and, and the other... Said you can't come in. Because they don't know, because they might be letting in, they might be, they might be accepting terrorists. It's... It's a, it's a mess. It's a, yeah, it's a mess all the way around. It's an absolute mess. Israel's destroying a country. I heard this the other day. This comment was made the other day. Israel, what Israel's doing to a lot of Palestine, that's going to birth whoever survives the next group of Hamas. At some point, you have to say it doesn't matter. Effing mess. At the same time, right around the corner, another effing mess with Ukraine and Russia. Mm One more topic, then we'll get to your comments here. It's really difficult to say this because the football team is 2-6 and six on the season, UVA football. 
They started 0-5. Mm-hmm. UVA football's got four games left. Georgia Tech, Saturday, Louisville, Duke, and Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech to close the season at home. If UVA runs the rest of the games, gets wins in its final four games, it finishes 6-6 six and six on the year, it's bowl eligible, and Tony Elliott's on the short list for coach of the year. If it wins three of its last four games, it finishes 5-7, and seven, and now in 2023, because there's so many bowl games, some teams make the postseason at 5-7. and seven. Tony Elliott probably is in the top three or four for coach of the year if he finishes 5-7. and seven. Do you guys know how close the UVA head football coach was to ACC coach of the year? Four games were played this year where UVA lost by three points or less. Boston College, NC State, JMU, and Miami. They just lost to Miami in overtime. There's four games on the schedule this year, four losses, all four were losses, where UVA football lost by three points or less in each of those ball games. If they had had some better luck in those contests, Virginia would be 6-2 and two potentially and not 2-6, and six, and Tony Elliott would be up for National Coach of the Year, not just ACC Coach of the Year. The Wahoos were picked by Vegas oddsmakers in the preseason to win. The over-under was set at three and a half games. Over-under at three and a half games. They were picked dead last in conference play. And I don't have anything for moral victories. I think moral victories are BS. But this football team is a two and six football team you don't want to play. They've had two quarterbacks a revolving door at offensive line. They're still healing from a tragedy, a mass murder from last year. They have a chance, crazily, to make the postseason if they run out. And they're two-point favorites against Georgia Tech, two o'clock kickoff, Scott Stadium this Saturday. Bananas. And one other item out of the sports section on the I Love Seville show, this is out of the sports section. UVA basketball, its first ball game is Monday. Tarleton State, John Paul Jones Arena. This Monday, its second game against the Florida Gators, November 10th, neutral site, Charlotte, North Carolina. Basketball season starts on Monday. Tony Bennett's team is loaded. They were picked to finish fourth in the ACC preseason. They have eight to ten guys who legitimately are going to get minutes. Eight to ten guys with upside and outside shooting everywhere. That's been the issue for Virginia, outside shooting. They got it by the spades in spades this year. Two-shot Judah Wickhauer. You said you wanted to highlight something that you read on the, uh, on the interwebs before the program. Show is yours on what you wanted to highlight. Uh, care to be more... This is the closing thoughts portion for Judah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Charlottesville's expanding its EV infrastructure. And uh, apparently... Uh, Car thefts have uh, have been massively ramping up around Charlottesville, so uh, be careful with your cars. Park in lighted spots. Make sure you lock them, and uh, don't leave anything uh, don't don't leave anything you don't want stolen in your car. Good call to action right there from J Dubs. Thank you. You know why car break-ins are increasing around the area? Go ahead. You know why? What's your guess? Uh, my guess is people in uh, financial difficulty. Survival. That's why. Crime escalates in times of economic hardship. Mm-hmm. Survival. That's why break-ins are increasing around the area. How do I pay my bills and put food on my table? If you're just tuning into the program, I encourage you to go to ilovesevil.com, check our lead story on how Sonia Smith is influencing a school board election. She's directly and indirectly contributed $85,000 to the Allison Spillman campaign. 85 grand. 70 Gs in direct contributions, 15K through a political action committee directly tied to the Spillman campaign. It's absolutely bananas. A school board race has a combined $315,000-plus in raised dollars. 
Carol Thorpe says, Jerry, the clamor of complaint about too much money influencing politics that typically cries from the left is strangely absent in Albemarle and Charlottesville when it comes to Sonia Smith. That's what we call starts with an H. She's exactly right. Exactly right. At the start of this race, the Spillman side said Bryce was trying to buy the election. I will say this again. At the start of the school board race, the at-large race with Bryce and Spillman, Meg Bryce got out to a massive fundraising advantage. Massive advantage. And Spillman's campaign and team screamed she's trying to buy the election. Now the roles have been reversed, and Spillman has a lead of 190,000 to 125,000. And those folks that scream buying an election are now radio silent. Radio silent. <coughs> Sarah Hill Buchensky. The hate and the money thrown against Bryce indicates that she scares the Democrats. On a board of seven where she might be one dissenting voice, what are they scared of? Could it be that she would bring transparency? Thank you, SHB, for your comment. The new show on the I Love Seville Network airs Thursdays at 2.15 p.m. The debut is this Thursday at 2.15 p.m. Details to come. A key candidate for an office in Almaro County will be on the show this Thursday at 2.15 p.m. Mark your calendars for the newest addition to the I Love Seville Network lineup. For Judah Wickhauer, his salmon, his carrots, his celery, his drinks, his cream cheese, his everything bagel, and I really like that sweater. I sincerely mean that. I give you props for that sweater every day. Thank you. You're looking sharp. My name is Jerry Miller with our Easy Squeeze Yogurts, our non-dairy baby food, our granola bars, fruit snacks, juice boxes, peanut butter quesadillas. Peanut butter what? Yes, our oldest likes peanut butter quesadillas. No cheese, no chicken, no salsa, just peanut butter on quesadillas which I guess would be tortillas. Yeah, I don't know if you'd call that a quesadilla. He eats peanut butter tortillas, legitimately. He'll do well in college. Yes, he will. This is the I Love Seville Show. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.